I'm so excited. I think maybe we're streaming live on Facebook. We, we came on early this morning because last week was so hard. So we're just going to chill for a minute. We're not going to formally start because why would anyone be here at 9.58? But hey, we are because that's the kind of people we are. And Aisha gets the extra credit because it's like four in the morning where she is. I mean, you said 9.58. I'm like, I don't know what time zone you're in, but it's not mine. <laughs> One is seven. It's me and Rodney. That's right. Rodney. It's Rodney. Rodney gets extra credit too. I know. It's almost lunchtime here. <laughs> it's funny. Sometimes in CLF, different people are eating different meals. You know? <laughs> Someone's eating breakfast while someone else eats lunch. We are definitely live. Thank you, Facebook. <laughs> the gods of Spirit. Facebook are smiling today. <laughs> All right, we're going to give it a couple more seconds. Mm -hmm. Everybody is privileged to see the, the silly before the view chat today because we're live <laughs> for it. Yeah. Normally, we would be saying really hideously inappropriate things right now. <laughs> but today, yeah. we're just smiling. <laughs> All right, we have one more minute to be silly. All right, get your faces on, everyone. Yeah. Here, look at the flowers behind me. Meg has beautiful flowers. We're kind of all like, wow. Those roses are, are those roses? Yeah, the roses are not from the market. My girlfriend gave me those. So. Uh -huh. I know, a little romance, but she gave them to me right the same day I brought home four bouquets from the farmer's market. So they're in the mix. Oh, yeah. I'm like, I gotta mess it up. That's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we're going to start. Thank you so much to everyone for bearing with us last week. Uh, Antonia, our fabulous tech person, did nothing different last week than they did today, getting us on early. So, yeah, here we are. Anyway, it's great to be here. I'm Meg Riley in beautiful autumn. Minneapolis, where it's, I got out my slippers this morning to put on my feet, you know, but it's just perfect in the morning, especially. It gets a little hot in the afternoon, but the mornings are just gorgeous. Aisha Hauser, how are you today? Hi, I'm Aisha Hauser in Seattle, Washington. Um, it, 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 I'm good. It's already raining, and so uh, it's usually a faster walk with my dog because both my dogs, they hate the rain, so they do what they need to super quick to get back inside. They're very funny. But when it's nice, Sal, they just leisurely, la, la, la. So it's it hilarious a little bit. Uh, Michael Tino. Isha Hauser, how are you today? Uh oh Hi. I'm doing great, Asia. <laughs> I'm joining you from my office in Mount Kisco, New York, at the UU Fellowship of Northern Westchester. And, um, and life is, is OK. Uh, I don't really, I don't have much to say about what's going on here. It's still September. It's like September 94th, right? And um, September is the longest month this year, so it's good. Antonia, you are uh, in Delaware, yes? I am in Delaware. It was beautiful outside. Um, it's like a, the end of summer, fall day, so the weather is nice, a little, little bit breezy. I don't know. I don't see any sun coming in my windows now, so that may have all changed. That's Delaware. I'm doing really well today. Happy to have our host, I mean, our host here and all of the people that we have here today. Really excited about our subject. So, yay. Welcome, everyone. Fantastic. Antonia, do you want to share what you'll be doing? What I like bringing comments over from Facebook and sharing them with everybody here. Oh, I'll be bringing comments over from Facebook and sharing them with everyone here. <laughs> it looked like you were going to say, no, I'm not. <laughs> I was like, what am I doing? What do you know? <laughs> there you go. We're all giddy with relief to be live, I think, seriously. So thanks for those of you who bore with us last week. and. Uh, watched it later. I, I listened later too. So it was a good show. Thanks to Michael and Asia for holding it down. And um, before we get going with this week's show, where we're going to talk about a very exciting ministry, um, I wanted to see what's new in UU land. So can I just name the climate change march? I mean, it was great in that it's not great we're destroying the earth, 
and it was great that so many folks around the country uh, bore witness and went to mar local marches. But I, can I just name a wee teeny pet peeve? And maybe I, I need read, maybe it's just the September is the longest month, second only to May. Um, I keep seeing on my feed, like hundreds of you use strike for the climate. And I'm like, I mean, yes, and like, do we need to quite center ourselves that way? I mean, I, I say this with love and kindness, but millions were marching all over the world, but we need to like clap. I, I, am I just being snarky? I don't, there was something about that headline that I'm like, can't, I mean, really? Do we need to, I guess we do. I, and I just need to accept it and, and be kind and have compassion in my heart, so. It, it struck me as strange too, so I can be snarky with you, but I, I always rise to the invitation of being snarky with you, Asia. Um. <laughs> when she goes snarky, we go snarky. Ooh. I, it's, it struck me as strange, but I think it's good that we can say how many like marches that we were present in and, um, and that you, you youth are leading um, this in various parts of the country, including as one of the lead plaintiffs, one of one, a 10 year old UU from Florida is one of the lead plaintiffs in, um, in the, the, the case that's currently uh, in federal court. So I think it's great that we can say, yes, we're, we're part of this, um, but hundreds of UUs and 4 million people or whatever is, what was weird. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I want to echo the excitement about the, um, the organizing that went on to make it happen by youth. Here in Minneapolis, um, the daughter of Elon Omar, my elected rep, was one of the main leaders. And, you know, just seeing the next generation of leadership, I mean, Elon's already the next generation from me. So seeing, you know, a couple generations down, really just in there, so wise and so active and so, you know, uh, saying how much we've screwed things up, you know, um, it's very moving. And I keep thinking about this line. I was watching an interview with Michelle Obama and someone said, well, do you feel hopeful? And she said, it's not a choice. We, we can't hand off hopelessness to the young people. We just can't. So it wasn't about how she felt. It was about like what, she, what we need to do. And I feel like that really moved me. And I, I keep thinking about that, that we can't just we who are older can just go, oh my God, it's just terrible, you know, and, and leave it to the young people to say it's terrible and we're going to fight. So, um, yeah, so I was really moved by it. And shout out to Peggy Clark, who just did a huge amount of work getting Unitarian Universalists engaged, as did a whole lot of other people. I went to the webinar that um, some of the Love Resist people did, which featured some of the UU young people who are doing things in various places. And it was very moving to hear from them and um, really exciting. And I hope that we'll be able to do a show later where we feature some of them because it's not like there was a strike and now it's fixed, <laughs> you know, the work goes on and I'm really excited by that. Antonio, you look like you wanted to say something about it. I just think that it's important that we recognize the intersectionality of the climate strike. I, um, I struggle with um, the idea when people um, exalt, like, we want to make sure that we are saving the planet and the rain, uh, all the waterfalls and all these things. And I'm like, yeah, and we want to make sure that children don't have to drink lead. And we want to make sure that people don't live in trash. And we want to make sure that people have access to food. And so I really, I really struggle when we frame it in a way as, you know, that environmental justice is not related to racial justice is not related to class justice so Amen. Well, and truly environmental justice is racial justice and class right. justice i mean environmentalism mm -hmm. might not be but um environmental justice comes starts from a place that recognizes that systems of oppression are are at work mm -hmm. in making sure that the the impacts of climate change and other environmental degradation is disparately spread, right? Yeah. So people with less power get more of the pollution, they get more of the effects of climate change. Um, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And indigenous people have been sounding the alarm for, I don't even, decades and decades? Um, Hundreds of years, I think we could legit say. So one of the things I found so moving about the leadership here is that it was very intersectional. And Amy Goodman had two organizers from Minneapolis on the Democracy Now! show. And they were both um, of heritage from Somalia. And she was saying, how's this playing out in Somalia? And one of them, um, whose name I'm sorry, I can't remember, said, yeah, my family who's still in Somalia, there's huge drought and it's a huge problem. I live in North Minneapolis. I live like in a dump. You know, I mean, literally, there's a dump over there and um, uh, they're burning and, you know, just like saying, yes, both of these places are impacting my family very personally. And I, I thought that was a really powerful statement. Like, you don't have to go to Somalia to see how unjust this is. It's right in Minneapolis. So what else is up? We're, we'll try to have a show on that soon. I noticed that some resources got released and I was trying to figure out who to say, release them. Is it the UUA? I know a bunch of groups work together on it. I think it ultimately came from the, um, um, I wanna say the Faith Development Office, but I'm trying to figure out if that still exists. It's part of the ministerial, you know, cause people combine. Um, but it, but it was the curriculum developers, Gail Forsyth Vale, Susan Lawrence, Carrie, Mc, well, Carrie McDonald, the executive director led, uh, a group of stakeholders and they, they, folks were meeting through the summer to um, help put out resources um, about uh, co having conversations about liberation. I do want to name that the moderator search committee keep putting out funny memes of, of anxiety that I guess they haven't gotten um, uh, applications out yet. So those of you thinking about it, apply to be moderator. <laughs> I don't know. They, they just put out a meme yesterday, or at least I saw it yesterday. So that's happening. I didn't see that. I wanted to go back to those resources, though, for liberation. It's a good way to structure conversations in your congregation about free speech and just some of the stuff that's coming up, um, maybe in not such helpful ways. It's a way to frame uh, conversations that actually could move forward a bit. So, um, yeah, I just want to um, hopefully we can get folks on to talk about those more as well. Yeah, and we read the the letter, the call to to engage in this work that was jointly issued by the, the UUA and DRUM and Commission on Institutional Change and Trust and ARE and Loreda and the UUMA and a whole bunch of <laughs> organizations like all jointly issued this this call to engage in this, which was really surprised a lot of us um, in a good way. Yeah, there's some it's nice to have good surprises. All right, I've asked Michael Tino to take over today's show because it's featuring a program of my own congregation, Church of the Larger Fellowship. I'm sure I won't be able to keep my mouth shut, but it seemed a little self-serving for me to facilitate the conversation. So Michael, why don't you introduce our guest? I would be honored to do that, Meg. Thank you. And, and I will say so, um, as, as a volunteer member of the, the Church of the Larger Fellowship, who, uh, who does this, this work here on The View as sort of my contribution to my congregation. Um, one of the main reasons why I'm called to maintain membership in the Church of the Larger Fellowship is because of the transformative work of the prison ministry. So I'm really excited to welcome Rodney Lemery and Beth Murray onto the show today, and I will introduce um, them to you. Uh, Rodney Lemery is a UU minister and jail and prison chaplain. And Rodney started working with the CLF in 2018 as um, our learning fellow assigned to the Worthy Now Prison Network. And he's now the minister for that program. His primary role in that position is to provide an environment where the shared ministry of the team results in providing pastoral care and religious education to the over 1,070 incarcerated members of the Church of the Larger Fellowship. I want to repeat that. 1,070 and growing incarcerated members of the CLF. The engagement of other UU congregations is in this important work is also a main objective of the Worthy Now Prison Network. And let's put a pin in that because I want to talk about that today. 
Um, and also we have Beth Murray, a lifelong UU who started working with the CLF in 2005. Beth has a variety of responsibilities, including membership, serving as publication coordinator for the Quest Monthly, the CLF's worship publication. And um, her passion is working with the prison ministry team. So Beth and Rodney, uh, welcome. I'm gonna turn my phone off because I've been reading my, your, your bios from, from my email. Um, it's great to have you here. Talk to me about uh, 1,070 members and, and growing of the, uh, of the prison ministry, the incarcerated members of the Church of the Larger Fellowship. Um, how did that come to be? That, that it's so many um, and um, how do we serve 1,070 people? I mean, that, that by itself is one of the largest congregations in Unitarian Universalism, right? Just the prison ministry is one of the largest congregations in Unitarian Universalism. That's pretty astounding to me. Rodney, do you wanna? Well, I can. I can tell you my, first of all, thank you so much for having us, super excited. Um, and given that, that anti-racism is often and the focus of the view, I just wanna step into the saying and acknowledging that I am a Caucasian man working in a system that is largely affecting black and brown bodies. And I don't start any of our PIC 101, our prison industrial complex trainings without acknowledging that. And so I want to acknowledge that here today. I do work in a jail setting as a volunteer assistant chaplain. So I am uh, directly in touch with those bodies that are affected, but I myself don't share the same uh, impact. And so I just wanna acknowledge that and put that out there. And now to your question about how that happened, I think we need to hear from Beth on that because she's got the amazing institutional knowledge. I've been here uh, far too short to tell you anything except this past year. Now this past year, I can say that it was intentional partnerships that our previous director, Mandy Goheen made with uh, a publication called Black and Pink which serves HIV positive uh, incarcerated folk and word of mouth happened. And we saw a massive um, interest in the Worthy Now Prison program, largely because people find out we facilitate- I want to share what, they said, what the person said in the newsletter that brought in so many people. It's really moving to me what they said. Do you so have that? It wasn't because we advertised in that newsletter. Right. I, I actually have a screenshot of that, but the, uh, to paraphrase, this person wrote about if you really want a church that will accept you and love you, you need to know more about my congregation. And from that very small comment, we got hundreds of inquiries all at once. This was... Uh, the black and pink issue was last October. Yeah, and black and pink I'm familiar with also does an amazing ministry um, to mostly uh, people of color, mostly LGBTQ uh, imprisoned folks. So it's uh, uh, started by Reverend Jason Lydon, the UU mm -hmm. minister who's moved on, but yeah. there's no uh, second Unitarian in Chicago. So Beth, you want to tell us a little bit about the history of, of prison ministry and how we, we got here? Because I'm just fascinated. I, I, I've known it's been going on for a long time, but I will admit, I don't really know where it came from or how it got to be what it is today. But oh, when I first question. started, yeah. I mean, I can't, I can fill in some of those blanks. So when I first started working for the CLF back in 2005, I was not part of the prison ministry program. But I remember that there was one, and there were about 30 members. So it started as a small but very intentional group that just grew because people would have a conversation with their cellmate. People would find an issue of the UU world left 
behind. Um, so conversations and observations, things that are happening in the facility, because we're certainly, CLF is not recruiting these members. This growth all happens because of somebody has shared an issue of Quest Monthly. Um, so, and then black and pink just made us grow astronomically. So, incarcerated. I, I, mean, I said I wouldn't keep my mouth shut. Oh, I just want to God. say that that our incarcerated members, I think, are just model Unitarian Universalists in that they found something that's helping them and they want to share it, as kind people do. And it's all their leadership. It, as Beth said, it's not because we've put out ads or done anything. It's all leadership coming from people who are incarcerated who tell us consistently that this bit of kindness and acceptance changes and transforms their lives. And they experience the church, the larger fellowship as a faith community. And I think that's the, um, where I've been um, wanting to, I don't know, inspire. I'm trying to put a positive spin on here because I've been told not to call our places country clubs. So I won't. Um, and I think that's, that's what, what I hear you speaking to Meg and Beth and Rod, that folks fi find comfort and solace and experience this as a life-saving faith and share that, you know, it's the flame, the more candles you make from the one flame doesn't make a, you know, the flame doesn't go down. Um, and wouldn't it be great if our brick and mortar places were as generous of spirit? I can't tell you the number of letters that I get from people who say, I've been disowned by my family, um, not always because of why the reason that they're in prison to begin with, but because they might be a trans person. And the letters that I get that say, you are now my family. Thank you for being my family. Thank you for not forgetting me. Thank you for being here. You've brought me such comfort. It just gives me goosebumps every time I read a letter like that. I'm curious when folks come out of um, being incarcerated, do folks try our brick, brick and mortar places? Is that, um, and has that worked? How are they received? Um, I'm curious about that. So re-entry is an area that our prison ministry wants to grow into by partnering with some re-entry uh, groups that are out there. We, I think Beth and, and Meg would agree, we don't do such a hot job transitioning from the institution into back into the reentry world for our returning citizens uh, yet. We're hoping, we're working on it. Um, but I mean, I think we have stories of people attempting to find the same I mean, I'll just be blunt, the same love and acceptance that the CLF shows them um, with bounded behavior. Let's be clear. We love everyone, but the behaviors that brought them where they are are sometimes egregious and have to be uh, set up with boundaries. Um, but that that kind of unconditional acceptance and love is what they're searching for in our brick and mortar. And I think Beth and Meg probably have more anecdotal evidence on how successful or unfortunately not successful that has been. Well, yeah, we're not that great at that, but nor are a lot of facilities great at that. I get all kinds of letters from people saying, I'm about to be released and I don't even know how can you send mail to me when I'm about to be homeless? So I do a lot of online research trying to find um, resources that are not even related to UU resources that in my mind, those resources should be coming from a facility to help them, a person make that transition. I also include lists of congregations if they at least know where they're going to be I'll say here are other UU congregations in your area. But, I, I, but then too, that's a problem because frequently an incarcerated CLF member will write to that congregation and not get a response back. 
So a lot of our members, once they are released, they're, they're kind of in limbo. Um, they may not have a place to live. They may not have, they might be living at a place where they don't have an address. So it is hard for them to remain in touch with the CLF. I'll just say there are some amazingly positive stories that we hear and some really heartbreaking stories. It really runs the gamut. Um, and, and I can't resist throwing in a systemic piece that the reason that the facilities aren't providing that is because they count on recidivism and that the rate is incredibly high and, and that uh, people who get into that system, it's incredibly hard to get out and that's connected to for-profit prisons and a whole lot of other things. And um, so there's really, the system is set up for people to go back and we get a lot of people we find again because they've been sent back for some parole viol violation or another. And that's, that's the way the system works. I think doing this has really gotten us all as if we weren't already Rodney the most, but in touch with how authoritarian and how absolutely indifferent to humanity uh, these, these systems are. They have obscure rules that we're always trying to work around for anything that we do and they're totally random. They're enforced randomly. And um, yeah, it's just I, one of the letters that I got that I just think about all the time is somebody who said, you know, this place is trying to turn me into a beast and my spiritual practice is refu to refuse to be one and that's what you're helping me to do is to, is to refuse to be a beast. And that really is what the systems do. They, they set up prisoners to fight with one another. They set up violence in the prisons. They, I mean, between the prisoners, between guards and prisoners, you, you just hear all the stories. And of course, some of the stories you, you don't know, you know, it's just somebody telling you something, but a lot of them are so consistent that you really go, yeah, this is, this is how they're living. And this is in the, this is where the, this is where Unitarian Universalism gets in there and they say it saves my life. And, and so to me, whenever anyone says this is a religion only for the privileged, I'm like, look at these people who are model Unitarian Universalists and what they're saying. This is a religion for anyone who practices it. And yeah. So let I, me oh, oh. go ahead, Rodney. Well, I just want to say based uh, just kind of reinforce what what both I think Asia and Meg are saying. One of the things that shocked the bejesus out of me really is that we have this faith movement called Unitarian Universalism that is this container that is capable of holding disparate thoughts and disparate beliefs in a way that is structured enough to give appropriate boundaries when used well. And I am just impressed so much at the letters we get, and Beth can talk to this too, that will run a range of spiritual practices. People who are atheist agnostic, Buddhist, born again Christian. We have a lot of people who consider themselves to be born again Christians, but they are also Unitarian Universalists. For me, the, the amazing thing that has changed my heart and perspective on our faith is seeing the possibility of having this Unitarian Universalist faith lived in a way that truly gives people the free search for truth and meaning that we, we long for in our brick and mortar institutions. But sometimes we, we have such a, at least in my experience, uh, difficult time giving that grace to one another in those those institutions. So I just wanted to say that while we were talking about faith and spirit. Well, I, I wanted to give an example of a letter that I received. It was from a person who he, has a life sentence. He's in solitary confinement. He's allowed to go outside for 15 minutes a day. And when he goes outside for 15 minutes a day, he said what he misses most is, is not being able to see nature. So the, the brick wall, concrete wall, is at, between that and the barbed wire is up high enough that he, he cannot see anything green. 
Um, but he, he also wrote that he reads everything that he gets from the CLF over and over because we are the ones that are keeping him company. And so I went online. I just copied and pasted a picture of a waterfall and put it in a letter and said, I know you can't see nature for real, but just know that I'm sending you this a picture of nature. And he wrote back and said that this picture is now taped to his wall. And he said he looks at it every day. And that is how he begins his spiritual day, knowing that we are just holding him. If it isn't evident uh, by Beth's story, the amount of pastoral care that she provides our incarcerated members is astronomical. And I am so grateful to kind of be in partnership with her. Well, I think it's, it's amazing to me that, that we can provide um, this, that, that level of care for uh, this population of folks who are so vulnerable. And so, um, I mean, they're, they're in a system that is, you know, I mean, Meg described it, sort of working to eat them up. So um, what, what else does, um, does CLF provide? I mean, I guess we, we have people who write letters. Um, how, how else do we, do we provide, Beth? Go, go. I'm so glad you asked that. Um, so yes, as a CLF member, our CLF members who are incarcerated receive Quest Monthly, which is the CLF worship publication. They receive that 11 times a year. They receive the UU Magazine, the UU World Magazine. Um, we send out a, uh, a Worthy Now newsletter twice a year where they're given choices of here's a reading project or here's three reading projects choose one that looks good to you uh, we offer correspondence courses so we are a very paper driven ministry offering resources to people that we wouldn't even ask them to contribute money we are solely dependent upon other people's generosity to support our incarcerated membership if they um they have to take a prerequisite course called a new unitarian universalist and if they take that course they're then eligible for a pen pal so we're constantly in a state of forwarding pen pal letters between a free world UU and a prisoner UU. Yeah, and you know, it really is largely at, uh, paid for by grants that we write and are, are uh, lucky enough to, to get, and also uh, through the generosity of people we know and also strangers. We are in the middle of a Faithify campaign right now. We have, I think, is it, I, I think it's like 20 days left, if I'm not mistaken, or we might be at 20% with 14 days left. 25% anyway. through the money and 50% through the days. If we don't get the money, we don't get any of it. We don't so. get anything. Hey, and also shout out to the UU Funding Panel, who has just been a really stalwart supporter uh, for years now and just um, supported all of our work. They're great. One of and our, if you are uh, interested in contributing, we do have the link to the Faithify, and I'm hoping that Antonia will be able to post that for you. Uh, I just posted it. Awesome. Thanks. One of our, um, our listeners, Kiana Perkins, wrote, I, I was struck by what she said, you, as you use, we have, um, let me start down here, blah, blah, blah. She says, we can't keep kids after they complete high school programming. UU has to work has work to do on how to transition folks from one reality into another. And we have plurality down, but we struggle with duality. Does anybody wanna talk a little bit about that? I find it head on. 
I mean, yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's sad. We're losing people in many different ways. Mm-hmm. Well, the, I think what's analogous to, I think, because um, it's the high school uh, youth that transition to the adult space. Um, to me, again, it go the, the youth, when you, if anyone here has ever gone to a youth con conference or a youth led worship, um, the youth embody faith community and they say, okay, how can we plan a worship that speaks to all the senses or, you know, that is an experience that encompasses as many all. And then there's the adult worship that is, you know, centered on <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the learned clergy and no offense, but <clears throat> is not quite as, um, it, it's not quite the same invitation to transcendence. I mean, I think we think we do it. However, when you experience it, uh, youth let, and so youth then go from the space where they've been invited to co-create and, and be, embody the faith in a certain way. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, no, you kind of have to do it this way. Um, and it, and in, at least in some spaces, uh, then there's the issue of coffee hour and who eats the cookies. So it even gets more granular, granularly absurd. And so, um, so I, so speaking to when we were talking about um, folks who are incarcerated who come out and that transition, that there's this love and openness and pastoral care from you folks from Church of Larger Fellowship, and then that it isn't manifested in the same way or at all in our brick and mortar congregations. So Kiana makes an excellent point. And I just want to chime in that there's the transition from being incarcerated to being in the free world, but as Beth Murray knows more than anyone, folks are moved around completely randomly, maybe twice in a month. I mean, just constantly. And we just actually added staff only to keep track of them because Beth's time, uh, it, it is incredibly time consuming to not lose them because if you lose the connection, it's gone. And if somebody put that much attention into keeping track of young adults who also often by their own choice, are moving around a whole lot, we would keep better in better touch with them too. So there's, there's that big transition, but then there are all these transitions, involuntary transitions usually, um, almost always, uh, for incarcerated people. And, and that takes a huge amount of staff time just to, just to make sure, because if, if you don't get that one loss, they're gone forever. I think, you know, for me, um part of the challenge is having people see Unitarian Universalism as an interconnected, interdependent faith movement, right? So the 1,700 plus incarcerated members of the CLF are part of my faith. A thousand. As a Unitarian Universal. 1,070. I said 1,000, whatever. It'll be 1,700 in three weeks. (laughs) <laughs> oh my god i almost fell out of my chair i was like does he know something i don't 1070 plus incarcerated members of that's not such a big difference uh members but they're part of my faith as a unitarian universalist right so if you beth said this person is being released from prison and is moving to your community um, I, as a minister, need to say, oh, there's a new, there's a Unitarian Universalist who's moving to my community, and it's part of my ministry to make them feel at home here. And, you know, we don't do, the, we, I, I was the director of Young Adult and Campus Ministry at our headquarters for six years, and spent six years trying to get congregations to welcome young adults who had moved to their community. Like, so we would get names of graduating high school seniors and I would send them to the congregation saying, oh, you have this young, new young adult who's moving to your community to go to college or get a job or whatever it was, or at the local military base or whatever it was that they were, they're moving to your community. And we would get responses like, so? Um, so to me, like the, the connect, thing that connects these things are how we 
see each other like as part of the same family, right? Part of the same faith. Well, and, uh, and so you're bringing up something that I think is missing from my side in that I am not contacting churches. I am sending an incarcerated member the name of a church and their address. And wouldn't that be amazing if I could reach out to congregations? It, it would be amazing if we could pay to have a staff member to do that, which means exactly. we have to raise a whole lot more money from Unitarian Universalists out there. Um, yeah. <laughs> we do have an option for congregations that are interested. They can sponsor. It costs about $150 per incarcerated member to do all of the services that we currently do, let alone what we would like to do, like Beth is saying. But we do have congregational partnerships available where congregations themselves can do share the plates or weave it into their social justice programming and try and uh, come up with ways to cover the membership fee for one or more of the incarcerated members. And I think Antonia has a link to our partnership program too. So if that is something you think your congregation would be interested in, please let us know. We can't do it alone. And I think, Michael, what strikes me is when I, when I listen to you talk, it's, it's basically what we've been dealing with as a faith movement for a long, long time. And that is how do we actively cultivate and touch the power of we? Like, if that is really in the center of our faith, this thing that is greater than ourselves, that has the possibility of encompassing all of us, how do we touch that? How are we actually going to embody that in our worship spaces, in our religious education, even in our, our welcoming of, of people maybe whose behaviors or potentially political affiliations we do not agree with, how, how do we still make space for the holy that is in them? I was in, I was in Tulsa um, for a class at Meadville and we went to All Souls in Tulsa. And um, on the history tour that they give there, they were talking about someone who was accused of murder and the minister at that time um, uh, welcomed them into the church. And this is, I wanna say early 1900s. Sorry, all souls Tulsa if I get this wrong. But the point of it was that that minister at the time when there was pushback about allowing a murder in their congregation said the name of the church is all souls, not all saints. And so that idea of all souls, I think, you know, if you believe in a soul, let's say all people, when we talk about all people, there's this, that's kind of idea of, yes, these people, no, not these people. And to be frank, in Unitarian Universalism, it was like, yes, white people, but not black people. Yes, straight people, but not gay people. Yes, rich people, but not poor people. So now there are, we can go all day about yes, who, and no, who not. But when we talk about bringing people who have been convicted of committing crimes, are we saying yes, people who have not been convicted of committing crimes and no people who have been convicted of committing crimes? Because when we look at things that most people like to bring into the mix, domestic violence and sexual assault, and why we can't bring people into our congregations, I wanna say if we look at the statistics of victims of these things, those people are already in our congregations. So when we're talking about safer congregations, we need to think about all of the people, all of the souls, all of the people, including the people we may not have identified as that. So understanding that all of the things that we're trying to exclude are already there. All of the people are in the room. So what we're saying is yes, the people who have not been convicted and no to the people who have been convicted. And maybe we can look hey, at that. Amen, Sonia. Thank you. And it speaks to restoration and repair. We're such a, a nihilistic, we're such a punitive culture uh, in the United States, and we just want to destroy the other. And what does repair look like? What does restoration look like? Um, and, it, and it's not absent accountability. Um, 
and what we know about our mass incarceration incarceration system as Meg started the discussion with um, it is it's it's a uh, it's it's a system designed to keep people in a cage, which we're not meant to be. We're not meant to not see a tree. Um, and so what does rest restoration and repair look like? Given that we understand we're in a deeply inequitable system that is, you know, 13th, that replaced slavery with mass incarceration. So uh, it's, thank you for that, Antonia. That's beautiful, you're preaching on a Thursday morning. So I'm wondering, um, we mentioned at the top of the hour that uh, Worthy Now is seeking partnership from UU congregations. Uh, and if, if your ask is send us lots of money, that's great, I love that. I'll repeat that, like good. But my guess is that your ask is deeper than that. <laughs> So yeah. other than send us lots of money, which please do, um, <laughs> what else are we asking other UU congregations to do with the Worthy Now? I mean, so this year's uh, campaign is uh, sustaining justice and hope. And so what we really hope to do is focus on that sustaining piece, because at this rate, it is simply just not sustainable. Um, at some point this year, we are going to have to make tough decisions about just how many individualized pastoral care responses can we actually accommodate versus standardizing a, a pastor, pastoral care message, which is a terrible, for, for me, and I think Beth as well, it's a terrible feeling. We want to be generous in spirit and, and love, and that requires time and effort to, to do these things. So working together with congregational partners would be a way for us to, to sustain this work. And that means not just economic support, which we, like you said, please send us money, we will gladly accept it. But we are also interested in partnering with congregations who feel they are ready to take on some of the actual uh, work that we are doing. And that could come in the form of distributing pen pal mail. Um, just to give you an idea, this year alone, up to this point, Beth has navigated forwarding and accepting a mail from both free worlders and incarcerated members. 1,166 pieces of mail have gone through the Boston office just just from January till now. So that is a that is a lot of effort that she has to open up the envelopes, distribute them out, repackage them into a neutral address and send them out again. It's it's very labor intensive. So transitioning that work to local congregations who maybe are in proximity to certain prisons or jail systems would be something we are looking for sponsoring congregations to do. Uh, printing and distributing the reading packets that are so generously donated to us by Skinner House and Beacon Press, that would be an activity that we would hope congregations could take on. And also our, what I'm very, excited about is we have a number of tapestry of faith curricula that have been turned into correspondence-based courses that we use as our religious education program for the incarcerated members. But this year, we, I, with Amanda Aikman's uh, book, uh, Full Spectrum Joy, have converted that class into an in-person class to give our congregations the option of doing a small group ministry within the prison or jail system, more like what I do on Fridays in my Solano County Jail role. So we are piloting that with Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church here in the Bay Area. And we'll be starting that in-person small group ministry class, kind of what the, the Baptists do in my jail. They do Bible study every week. And so this would be like the UU equivalent of a Bible study program. And so we have a variety of ways for congregations to get involved. And if you're one tiny congregation, one model that we've seen recently work is in North Texas, where a conglomerate of UU con congregations came together and are actively supporting the work that we are doing in the prison ministry. So totally um, 
be on the lookout for, for that. Check out our website. There's information on there how to get involved or uh, just express your interest. And I'm happy to talk to people be about it. Become a pen pal. So we have a, a huge waiting list of CLF members who are currently incarcerated who have taken our introductory new Unitarian Universalist course. They filled out a pen pal application, but then we're, it stops because we don't have enough free world people willing to write. I just know. I want to chime in that this work as a pen pal or leading classes is not just giving something to someone else. It's, it is a deeply transformative experience on the other side. I wanted to lift up that we've done full spectrum joy Amanda, Amanda Aikman's class as a correspondence class before and reading the responses, I'll tell you what, it's really humbling. I re so full spectrum joy takes the colors of the rainbow and associates them with practices that can keep you in gratitude and joy. And green is to align yourself with something that's living. And I'll never forget a, a, one of the responses that I got from a man who was in solitary. He'd been in solitary. He was going to be in solitary. And he said, you know, there was nothing living in my cell to align myself with. But then I saw ants on the floor. And I laid down and I spent the morning watching and learning from the ants. And you're right, it did bring me joy. And I'll tell you what, when I'm feeling a little sorry for myself, I think about that and I'm like, how dare you? I mean, these people are practicing faith in conditions that I can only hope, you know, that I would want to be like them. Yeah, I mean, I can't underscore the fact that I am transformed in who I am today because of the relationships I've built with incarcerated people. Um, it's, yeah, there's nothing more to say. It's, it's highly transformative work. So all of the information for congregations or folks out there to sign up for being a pen pal or doing some of this work is at the CLF website or at the prison ministry website or I, I, Tony has got that link probably in the Facebook live feed already but I've posted it in the feed and then I will post it again as a regular post on our CLF page and we have so a website Facebook live campaign for? going on so you'll see different things It's a, the worthynow.org website is worthynow.org. Awesome. Worthynow.org. Yeah, and the Faithify campaign um, I was looking at, that is uh, specifically um, says to, to help sponsor incarcerated members. And, and we're trying to raise $10,000 in that, and we have $2,950 raised. And it is matched. So every dollar you give is doubled. So it's, it's very helpful for us to, to meet that goal of 10,000. And like Meg said, with Faithify campaigns, it's all or nothing. So if we hit our deadline and we haven't made the 10,000, then we, we won't receive any of the money donated. So we have 14 days to left to raise $7,000 or we get none of that. Yeah. We, I, I just want to, absolutely sing from the rooftops the praises of church of the larger fellowship without this church of the larger fellowship this prison ministry wouldn't be happening souls of thousands of people would not be touched right so i don't want to you know i don't even think we can overestimate how important that is and the ripple effects of that that we are living out universalism and you are no one should ever be told they are not loved right um and so I'm, I'm so deeply grateful to the, the ministry of you all and, and how, um, Meg, I'm now going to sing your praises, your generosity of spirit and your leadership that empowers and inspires uh, the folks who you lead, your staff, um, ripples. And then it, it you, more and more goes out. So I, I'm so deeply indebted and grateful for the Church of Larger Fellowship and what you all are doing because this would not be happening it's a, it's a right direct cause and effect so give money uh both to the prison ministry and join clf 
to continue. So um, just deeply thank, grateful. Thank you. And thanks for singing my praises. But I want to say I inherited this wonderful ministry. It was really started, the first person joined 50 years ago, the first uh, imprisoned member. And uh, by the time I came on, Reverend Patty France was doing a deep ministry for, with about 300 people and has just continued to grow exponentially, again, through word of mouth by the folks themselves. And um, I do have an amazing staff. <laughs> I mean, and I have to say, though I love to talk about this program, they do all the work. <laughs> so I just have the mouth. They do amazing work. And you're seeing part of the team. Marga Lee, as you know, uh, from The View has moved over to be a part of the prison ministry team. And, you know, as Rodney or I think Michael, you said, this is one of our largest congregations just of incarcerated members. And, you know, they're not allowed to earn money. I mean, they're working literally for nothing or slave wages. One incarcerated member sent us his entire month's paycheck to share how much he valued it. It was $14. So uh, it and that was probably from full time work for a month too. Yes, fourteen. Because I, mean, I know that you know incarcerated yes. folks earn like eighty cents an hour. If they're that would be great, like eighty cents right. an hour. In some states, they're forbidden to earn a cent, and they still have to pay medical bills. And you know, every stamp that they send us, I know, is a sacrificial gift for them because they have to. I don't know if they jack up the prices on stamps, but they sure do on everything else. So um, yeah, it's, it's quite an amazing testament to me of, of the desire to stay connected that these folks are living out, connected with each other because in the classes they respond and then they get back the response, other people's responses and their own. So they get to see, you know, in full spectrum joy, they get to see how everybody's doing that and learn from each other. And um, so yeah, it's, it is, um, and, and again, I just want to lift up Reverend Patty France, who did a whole lot of that work uh, uh, very devotedly uh, for years. And so, yeah, I, I, um, this, this is an incredibly moving ministry that I want to thrive. And here's another side to this ministry that doesn't get spoken a lot about, and that is the support that Rodney and Meg give to the free world, a free world person who perhaps has a loved one that's incarcerated. They've become connected with the CLF initially embarrassed to even admit that they have a, someone that they know. And it, it's like, we're on it. This is, let us pull this person into our church family. Or a pen pal, a free world pen pal, who's had a long time relationship with an incarcerated pen pal, and the incarcerated pen pal has died. And all of a sudden Rodney is right there with pastoral su support. So the, talk about larger fellowship. We're not just talking about the prisoners. It, it's so much more than that. Yeah, thanks well, for bringing that up, Beth. Every time I preach, you know, I used to do the GLBT work back in the early nineties. And then I would see people in the back of the receiving line after I preached. And I would know that either they were gay or they had a gay family member, but they didn't want anyone to know. Now I look at the back of the line, I can always see who's got an incarcerated family member because it's the same shame and not wanting other people to know in their congregation. And so even as Antonia gave the speech about, you know, the perpetrators who aren't convicted are already here, the, the prison members are a part of every congregation People imprisoned are part of every congregation because their family members are already there. Whether or not they feel safe telling other Unitarian Universalists about it for a variety of reasons, they're already there. So, you know, yeah. Well, I'm aware that we only have about three minutes left and I'm wondering if Beth and Rodney, you have any final things you wanna leave us with uh, for the week. Thank you so much for, for this wonderful glimpse into our prison ministry. Well, just thank you. Thank you all. And really, anyone that's watching, I just encourage you to think about how the incarcerated members are using our faith in a way that empowers them to feel free to do their own spiritual path, whatever that might be, but still 
engages them in authentic relationships with people who may or may not believe, look, sound, or behave anything like themselves. And for me, that's the hope that I entered Unitarian Universalism with. And it's, a, it's something that I see lived out in, in incarcerated members. And so uh, that, that's something that I will, will continue to learn from and, and treasure. Yeah, what he said. We, we just need everybody's help. We get help from emotional help from our incarcerated members. We get emotional help and financial support from our free world members. But we, it's at the rate that we're growing, we just cannot sustain this program without everybody's help. Help. Excellent. Well, I hope people have heard that <laughs> out there. Um, I really do. I do because I, I um, have heard the testimonies and I've seen those letters and I know that the, the prison ministry that CLF does is life-saving. It is, it is life-saving ministry. So it is not like some we're making you feel good ministry. It is like actually saving people's lives ministry. So I hope people have heard the, the need and the, the need for connection and the, the need for resources. Um, we're coming to the top of the hour and next week we have Paula Cole Jones coming to us um, to talk about uh, inclusion and uh, some new work that she is doing. And Paula is always a fascinating and fabulous uh, person to talk with. And so I know that, that whatever it is we're going to be talking about exactly with her uh, will be interesting and worthwhile. <laughs> and can we Paul, mention Missing Christina this week? Yes. Miss Christina Rivera. Uh, we yeah. love you, Christina. We hope to see you next week. Yeah, we've been missing her. It's So thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>